Good morning, everyone. I feel uh, blessed this morning because that was slightly less comical and insulting than Dr. Smith usually is when he's had the opportunity to introduce me. But uh, let me, uh, on my own, again, welcome you and thank you for, for being here for this uh, early uh, session, uh, although it must not uh, have been too difficult to get most of you down to southern, uh, sunny southern and warm California, at least those of you that have traveled uh, a distance from colder places. So um, as Dr. Smith mentioned, I will try to review for you. Uh, the topics that I've been given are on the screen here, and I will try to review for you today, this morning, uh, both the treatment of hyperthyroidism, mostly focusing on antithyroid drugs, and then review hypothyroidism um, as it pertains mostly to Graves' disease, and this would be after, of course, the treatment of the hyperthyroidism. I don't have too many slides, so I hope that um, after we're done with the official slide presentation, that we'll be able to open it up for questions and have kind of an interactive session, uh, because the important thing is to have your questions answered um, with regard to either inconsistencies and in things that you've heard or questions that remain unanswered after um, having searched and asked questions previously. So, um, just as a matter of review, and the, the first few slides will be review slides um, and may overlap with things that you've heard yesterday. Um, this is a schematic of uh, the hypothalamic pituitary thyroidal axis, taking a look at the physiology um, that occurs with regard to the regulation of thyroid hormones. So up at the top, we have the hypothalamus, which communicates with the pituitary gland, which makes TSH that we all hear about when we have our testing done. The TSH, of course, stands for thyroid stimulating hormone, and that stimulates the thyroid gland to make thyroid hormone, which is important for every cell in the body to function normally. Then these thyroid hormones feed back to the pituitary. The pituitary senses the amount of thyroid hormone that's um, been produced by the thyroid and in turn regulates its production of TSH, closing the feedback loop. So if the thyroid hormones for some reason are low, this gets back to the pituitary as a low level signal, TSH is produced at a higher level, leading to more thyroid hormone production. And so when, as clinicians, your doctors focus a lot on TSH, it's because it's considered the thermostat of the body, determining what the thyroid hormone temperature is and l correcting the levels of, of thyroid hormone. There are a few occasions, as in the um, case of early diagnosis of thyroid disease, which we may get into, where the TSH remains suppressed because of the long duration of hyperthyroidism and is not useful clinically. Uh, and that may have come up in your, in your care or in questions that you may have. Uh, and that's one situation where we don't rely on the, on the TSH, but for the most part, um, these are the reasons why our TSH is considered um, the most important blood test to look at and not so much the actual levels of thyroid hormone. Now, in terms of the name, uh, and I don't know if this came up yesterday, but Graves disease is not a grave disease. It's named after Robert Graves, who got the initial credit, or most of the credit, for um, describing this condition back in 1835, although there were other investigators who were very close and have gotten some credit, um, but the, the name went to um, Sir Robert Graves. So is Graves' disease a common disease? The answer is yes. There are approximately Depending on the study that you look at, there are between 30 and 200 new cases per 100,000 uh, population per year. The prevalence of um, Graves' disease is higher in females than males, 
and approximately 2.5% of women and about 0.2% or one-tenth of that uh, of men uh, could, may have Graves' disease. And this um, appears to be distributed equally across races and um, countries around the, the globe. So now what is Graves' disease? It's an autoimmune disease and you may have heard, um, you heard I'm sure much more during the autoimmune, introduction to autoimmune, autoimmunity and autoimmune disease lecture yesterday. But basically in simplistic form, the immune system receives some type of insult. It's unclear yet what that is. There are ideas that we have, but we don't really know. And that leads to a dysregulation of the immune system to produce, among other things, antibodies, but also abnormal function of cells in the immune system. I'm going to focus on the antibodies because, as we'll talk about in a moment, that's important for the development of hyperthyroidism, which I've been given the task to describe how we treat it. So, uh, so antibodies are produced as well as cells that attack certain parts of the body, and if an organ like the pancreas is targeted, we develop diabetes. If the joints are targeted, we develop rheumatoid arthritis. And if the thyroid is um, targeted, we develop autoimmune thyroid disease. And one of the autoimmune thyroid diseases is Graves' disease. So now back to the question of the antibodies and how do the antibodies cause hyperthyroidism? So as we mentioned earlier, we have the pituitary gland in the brain and the thyroid gland that sits in our neck and they communicate via this circulatory path, this, this, this closed loop pathway where TSH is produced by the pituitary. It stimulates the thyroid hormone to produce thyroid hormones and these thyroid hormones, as I mentioned, feed back to the pituitary and control the level of thyroid hormones. When we have enough thyroid hormone, TSH secretion no longer goes up or is controlled at a certain level. And what happens with these antibodies are, that are produced is they have the distinct characteristic that they mimic the function of TSH as it uh, pertains to the TSH receptor on the thyroid cells. So the antibodies essentially push the TSH out of the way and take its place, and they stimulate in a similar way the thyroid to make thyroid hormone. And thyroid hormone levels go up, and this feeds back to the pituitary, and our TSH levels go down. That's why when we have hyperthyroidism in Graves' disease or other conditions, our TSH goes down. However, these antibodies continue to stimulate the thyroid in an unregulated way because their levels do not change. And so we, we wind up with a situation where we have elevated thyroid hormones, a low TSH, and this condition doesn't correct because the antibodies continue to stimulate the thyroid. When this happens, um, as many of you know, we develop the symptoms of hyperthyroidism and they're listed here, uh, mostly symptoms of hypermetabolism, anxiety, tremor, a large um, gland in many cases, um, feeling warm uh, because of the high metabolism, weight loss for similar reasons, uh, a rapid heartbeat, sometimes atrial fibrillation, which is a specific type of abnormal, unregulated, um, fast heartbeat, fatigue, difficulty sleeping, perspiration, brittle hair. Um, the menstrual periods are affected um, by creating or developing light menstrual periods and frequent bowel movements. These are common symptoms. There are others. And these symptoms are due to the excess thyroid hormone um, that um, we saw on the previous slide. Factors and associations, as we mentioned earlier, um, women um, are um, uh, affected by this disease at approximately a nine to one ratio compared to men. Um, adults 
are affected much more commonly than children. And I believe there's a talk on uh, Graves' disease in, in children that uh, is coming up this afternoon. Stress, we know that in times of stress, both personal stress, but also when we look at times of stress and look at countries um, or wartime, um, <clears throat> in the, um, during the stressful period and post-stressful period, um, the rates of Graves' disease um, increased. Post-pregnancy, um, after the delivery of the fetus um, and the reorganization of the immune system of the woman, which was suppressed in order to allow her to carry uh, a fetus of different genetic makeup, after the delivery, there is a reorganization of the immune system, and during that reorganization, just to put it simply, we're not sure exactly what happens, but there's a crossing of the wires, and we, can, uh, we do see an increase in autoimmune disease, including Graves' disease. Um, genetics um, are involved. We're not clear on the genetics that uh, lead to this disease. It appears to be a multi-genetic disease rather than a single gene. And then, more commonly, there are some infections which have been associated over time with the development of Graves' disease. Taking iodine uh, in large quantities has been associated with the development of Graves' disease. Unclear if it's, it's the association is with development of the autoimmunity or just the iodine, as we'll see in a few minutes, is a, um, a, a fuel that uh, the body uses, the thyroid uses, to make thyroid hormone, and giving excess thyroid, excess iodine can lead, can help put the thyroid over the top and develop the hyperthyroidism. And then smoking, particularly as it pertains to um, the Graves eye disease, as I'm sure you'll hear on, in the Graves uh, eye disease specific uh, talks, um, can make, has been associated with worsening of the ophthalmopathy uh, and challenges in, in treating it with our traditional methods. Diagnosis um, occurs with examination. Um, we see patients coming in with the classic symptoms, as we mentioned, a large goiter, um, possibly eye findings, which occur and are apparent clinically in approximately 20% or so of patients. Of course, we rely on blood tests to confirm the diagnosis, especially when the symptoms might be mild. And then sometimes, not always, we need to um, utilize a thyroid iodine scan. Uh, and again, there has been a talk on radioactive iodine and Graves and thyroid, where I'm sure you've heard some of this, but the thyroid um, is special in that it concentrates iodine, and thus we can use iodine both for diagnosis and for treatment because it specifically targets the, the thyroid. So sometimes we'll do a nuclear thyroid iodine scan to help make the diagnosis of, of Graves' disease. So back to the blood tests that we use. Um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, TSH, T3, and T4, and there are many different subtypes of these hormones, free hormones, free hormones done in certain ways, total hormones bound to proteins. Um, for the most part, they can all be used in the diagnosis um, of uh, hyperthyroidism with caveats in, in certain situations. Uh, and as I mentioned, the TSH um, is very important in the diagnosis and then the follow-up um, after treatment. Thyroid antibodies, um, what we usually check are what are called TSI, thyroid stimulating antibodies, and these can also be measured in different ways, but they essentially are the antibodies that I mentioned earlier, which push the TSH out of the way and stimulate the TSH receptor on the thyroid gland and make it produce thyroid hormone uncontrollably. Um, and then there are other antibodies, antithyroid peroxidase, as we'll see in a minute, the peroxidase is an enzyme in the thyroid gland that's important for how the, which allows the thyroid to use iodine. And so there can be antibodies generated against these, um, the anti-TPO and the anti-TG, two proteins that are important and specific to the thyroid. Um, and all three of these antibodies can be present 
um, in someone with Graves' disease. So now, the treatment of hyperthyroidism, beta blockers are commonly used. These are medications that block the hyperadrenergic, they block the, the beta, they block the, the beta receptors, which um, are receptors which um, translate the hypermetabolism of the thyroid into some of these symptoms that we mentioned. The high heart rate, the nervousness, the irritability, um, the wired type of symptoms that we have when we're hyperthyroid. Um, there are many different beta blockers. In effect, essentially, they all work um, in a similar fashion, again, with some minor um, caveats. Antithyroid medications, most commonly in this country, methimazole and PTU. Um, there are some differences uh, between the two, and more, more recently, there's been some data suggesting that PTU may be a little more risky in terms of its side effects, not that one is um, uh, devoid of side effects and the other medication has all the side effects. They both have side effects and we'll discuss that in a slide a little further down the talk. But um, for the most part, the um, associations have moved towards methimazole being first line therapy um, with PTU used less and in particular situations but both uh, are used uh, in this country. And then, as you heard yesterday, radioactive iodine, and as I believe you also heard, surgery for the treatment of um, hyperthyroidism. And I'll stop here and just make the point that um, while all these um, interventions are, um, have their risks and benefits and are all uh, helpful in terms of controlling the symptoms, they're crude but effective. They're a crude way to deal with the condition. We're not effectively treating the underlying autoimmune disease. We're not getting rid of the antibodies. We're not fixing the immune system. But we're destroying the thyroid or blocking it from working using medications or surgically removing the thyroid so that we get rid of the hyperthyroidism, which is um, causing or behind the majority of the symptoms. So the, the treatments are effective, but they're kind of archaic and paleolithic and, and crude. We're not really dealing with the pathophysiology of the disease. So, um, back to the, um, how these medications work. This is a schematic showing the thyroid gland. And first we'll just run through how the thyroid gland makes thyroid hormones and then we'll, we'll um, look at how each of these um, drugs work. Oops. So iodine, it's a little bit cut off here, but iodine is taken up um, by the thyroid gland and iodine is, forms the basis of, of thyroid hormone. Iodine is taken into the cell and organified or made part of um, a biologic protein by this enzyme, as I mentioned earlier, this thyroid peroxidase. I apologize, this, this uh, arrow keeps disappearing on me. So this thyroid peroxidase that I mentioned earlier can have antibodies developed against it, is responsible one of the, for the first step in organification of the iodine. There's further processing of the iodine, and then the, the iodine is placed on this thyroglobulin scaffold. Thyroglobulin is a protein that sits in the thyroid in the middle of these follicles because the thyroid cells are arranged in kind of a sphere and the iodine sits on this thyroglobulin. There can also, as I mentioned earlier, be antibodies that develop against this thyroglobulin. And in, on this thyroglobulin um, and with this iodine, the thyroid is able to make thyroid hormone. The thyroid hormone is released by a process of proteolysis from the thyroid. So. Uh, um, 
So the thyroid, um, uh, which has created this thyroid hormone, breaks it down by proteolysis, it's released into the blood and it goes into the periphery and acts um, on all the cells in, in the body. Um, and thyroid hormone, as I mentioned, is important for all cells in the body to function normally. So um, the thionamides, which are the antithyroid drugs, block this initial peroxidase step, this initial organification of um, thyroid hormone, uh, of iodine, as well as this second step, and that represents the major way in which they work to keep the thyroid from making thyroid hormone and then, of course, not being able to release it if it can't make it. Um, one of the, um, the, the two, um, PTU, also works in the periphery to block the conversion of T4 to T3. Most of the thyroid hormone that is made um, by the thyroid is T4, approximately 75% of um, T4 in the blood uh, comes from, um, from the thyroid. And T3, which is our active uh, hormone, is made mostly in the periphery where the cells take up the T4 and there are enzymes on the surface of the cell that convert the T4 to T3 and the T3 goes in the cell and works in the nucleus to have its effects. Um, so beta blockers uh, work here um, in the periphery. They block um, this conversion, and they also work um, on, on the cells, on the beta blockers to um, have their effects. Iodine um, can, in high quantities, um, work both here in this peroxidase step and here where the thyroid hormone is released, um, as well as here in the periphery to again, block the production and the action of thyroid hormone. Uh, and we'll talk in a little bit about um, iodine um, and, and how this can be helpful, but also detrimental when it comes to autoimmune thyroid disease. Now, side effects. There are um, many potential side effects that can occur with the antithyroid drugs, but they're pretty rare. Even the, the common side effects, um, such as the skin reactions, joint aches, um, some bloating um, or diarrhea, are rare in the low single percentage um, kind of rate. And then major side effects are even more rare. They can occur. We worry about them. But for the most part, antithyroid drugs are, are safe. Um, and commonly accepted and, and used without uh, many side effects. Although again, the, the, the significant major side effects can be uh, very severe. So, um, there are different ways to use these drugs, which maybe we'll get into in the question and answer session, um, in terms of how to use them, block and replace versus using them straight on to control thyroid hormone. We maybe, maybe get to this if you have questions. Um, but we'll move ahead then to um, the second half of the talk, which is um, the treatment of hypothyroidism. So for the most part, in this country, um, compared to Europe, we treat with the antithyroid drugs, we control the hyperthyroidism. We do attempt with the antithyroid drugs to achieve remission, which in certain situations of patients where there's a small thyroid, the hyperthyroidism is mild, um, after 12 to 18 months on antithyroid drugs, we can achieve anywhere from 20 to 30 percent overall, or in these really hand-picked cases, maybe up to 50 percent of cases of patients can achieve remission, where after that 12-month to 18-month period, your thyroid, your TSH is going up, your requirements for these antithyroid drugs are going low, and we can get to the point where we can actually stop the antithyroid drugs, and the patient does not exhibit hyperthyroidism. 
So again, that can occur, is more likely to occur on the order of anywhere from 30 to 50 percent, um, if the higher if the cases are well selected, um, less hyperthyroidism, smaller glands, and lower levels of these antithyroid antibodies that we mentioned. Um, over time, though, even after achieving this remission, most of these remissions are not long-standing remissions. So over time, over the subsequent five-year period, we have and we see recurrences commonly. And so while our colleagues in Europe um, tend to try to practice this more and have more success at it, uh, and that may have to do with iodine and iodine sufficiency versus deficiency, uh, which is common in Europe, compared to this country, it's, we're less successful at achieving these long-term remissions or significant remissions in this country. So we, for the most part, use um, antithyroid drugs to control the hyperthyroidism and encourage patients to then move on to something more definitive, which is either surgery or, in most cases, radioactive iodine to permanently ablate the thyroid. But we do um, have patients who um, stay on antithyroid drugs long term for, for different reasons, but it's not the, it's less commonly practiced in this country. So um, when we move on to radioactive iodine as a definitive treatment, a, uh, if we were to, to check or, or look at a scan after a therapy, it would look like this, a thyroid gland in the neck looking like a butterfly, um, both lobes left and right of the thyroid taking up this radioactive iodine and being destroyed. The iodine, as I'm sure you heard yesterday, concentrates in the thyroid um, and over a three to six month period, in most cases, leads to correction of the hyperthyroidism, ablation or destruction of the thyroid. And, and then we have to encounter the hypothyroidism that develops after the thyroid gland has been destroyed. And so on the schematic, we see many of the common symptoms associated with now the hypothyroidism, which we of course try to avoid. We don't allow patients to become hypothyroid um, after ablative treatment. They're followed closely and thyroid hormone is initiated uh, when appropriate before somebody develops hypothyroidism. So treatment with thyroid hormone can occur um, using many different modalities. There are many different medications that are available. Synthroid is the one that we most commonly hear of, but there are others. Um, tyrosint is a relatively new preparation, which is in a liquid gel type form, um, which on occasion, if you have a patient uh, who for some reason is allergic to or not tolerating the um, typical capsules because they do contain um, substances um, that to make the pill, the fillers of the pill, which can be a little bit different in each of these preparations, can in a rare occasion lead to allergies. Um, there's cornstarch and other um, um, constituents in there that um, may lead to a side effect or a, an adverse reaction and the tyrosine can't be help, can be helpful in that situation. For the most part, um, it's not smart to switch pre from preparation to preparation, but any of these preparations, if you stay within the preparation, the dose adjustments within the, the, the particular drug, um, they're all good drugs and they all work to replace um, your thyroid hormone levels. But switching from one drug to the other, so if you're on 100 micrograms of Synthroid and you switch to Lavoxyl, that switch may not be one-to-one -one, because the Lavoxyl 100 and the Synthroid 100 may not be equivalent. But going from 100 of Lavoxyl to 125, there will be that 25 microgram increase. Then we have T3, Cytomel. Um, replacing only with Cytomel is not recommended. The medication has a very um, short duration of action and you would need to treat multiple times per day. The, the Synthroid and the T4 is, uh, provides much more um, level um, levels. And um, where we use T3 is on occasion, and we'll talk about this in a couple of slides, 
um, when combination with T4 and T3 is thought to potentially be beneficial, um, and we'll get to that in a minute. And then there are combination preparations because of this idea of the utility of using T4 and T3. There are certain companies that make these combinations in different ratios. Um, Armour Thyroid is a um, porcine um, preparation, porcine thyroid preparation. So porcine thyroids are taken, chopped up, and um, created into a pill. Um, it's still used by some. Um, we'll get to this in a minute, but there's really no, um, no proof that there's any advantage to the uh, armor thyroid, and the company has done a better job of making its preparations consistent from refill to refill, but previously there have been problems with the um, combination, the amount of T4 and T3 in each pill from refill to refill. Um, Thyrolar um, is still exists as a preparation. Nature Thyroid and West Thyroid may actually uh, no longer be available on the market, but uh, they are preparations, combination preparations that have been used in the past. So now, the, um, in terms of guidelines for the treatment of hypothyroidism, the American Thyroid Association and the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists um, recently authored guidelines on the treatment of hypothyroidism. They haven't actually been published yet, but they've been distributed to the membership. They will be published uh, in November or December, um, but I thought it would be helpful to kind of go over um, uh, a few of these recommendations as they pertain to this audience. So the um, range of TSH in terms of what we consider normal um, is 0.45 to 4. And if you have questions about the range, we can in the question and answer session entertain those questions. There's a lot of, there's been discussion about decreasing the upper range of normal down to 2.5. And there's discussion about increasing the range because as we age, TSH increases. And so it's not clear that, um, it, it actually is becoming clear that we should probably have age-related or age-specific upper limits of normal for the TSH. But um, as a kind of an overall recommendation, if you don't have age uh, cutoffs, age ranges for your TSH, that the lower limit is 0.45 and the upper limit of is 0.4 uh, is 4.12. Recommendation 22 is that, for the most part, hypothyroidism should be treated with T4 monotherapy, not combination. And the truth is that the majority of patients feel just fine and do perfectly fine with just T4 as a monotherapy. Evidence does not support using the T4 and T3 combinations to treat hypothyroidism. There was a study approximately 13, 14 years ago um, from um, um, one of the European countries, the um, former USSR uh, bloc countries, that suggested that there may be a benefit to the combination, but subsequent to that, there have been eight to 12 studies trying to replicate those findings that have been largely unsuccessful in doing so. So as a general recommendation, T4 therapy as a monotherapy is what's recommended and effective, effective for most patients. Not much data to suggest that T4 and T3 as a combination is useful for the majority of patients. Now having said that, um, we all have patients and um, some of um, the patients, maybe some of you in the audience, who are not completely satisfied just on the T4. And um, as a community, we acknowledge and recognize this. And while we agree that the majority of patients do well just with the T4, and there's very little evidence, when you look at a whole group of patients that T4 and T3 is effective, that there may be a subset, a subset, a small percentage of patients that benefit from the combination. And there have been um, some genetic studies looking at the, um, the enzymes on the, I forgot to, to point out, 
I did mention the diiodinase in the periphery, in the, in the tissues that converts T4 to T3. There have been some genetics done which show that there, a small percentage of patients have a mutation at this um, enzyme in the periphery, and it's possible that that small subset of patients may be the ones that may benefit um, from this combination therapy because of a problem with converting the T4 to T3. Um, and so we continue to search for answers, uh, but as a general recommendation for the overwhelming number of patients, um, T4 alone is effective um, and T4, to T3, T4 and T3 combination doesn't help except for this very small uh, population of patients. But we continue to try to, um, to figure out what we don't understand um, and one day hopefully we'll be able to figure it out and offer the T4, T3 combination specifically to those that will, will benefit. In addition, um, the Armour thyroid, as we mentioned, is a porcine preparation. It's a desiccated thyroid hormone. There's no proof, there's been no comparisons and no proof that the Armour thyroid or desiccated thyroid hormone is in any way beneficial compared to um, your T4 monotherapy. Um, and um, the recommendation is that it should not be used to treat hypothyroidism. Selenium um, is interesting in terms of its treatment of hypothyroidism. Um, there is no role for selenium, but as you may have heard uh, in previous talks, there may be a role for selenium in the treatment of Graves' ophthalmopathy, um, and, but, but no, tr no, no role in the treatment of the hypothyroidism. And lastly, uh, many patients uh, come to us asking about um, supplements and nutraceuticals as they've been described um, to try and treat hypothyroidism in a natural way or supplement the thyroid. Um, and there's no proof that there's any benefit to these agents. They haven't been studied. Uh, and in addition, many of these over-the-counter natural type of thyroid uh, helping preparations may be spiked with thyroid hormone, actual thyroid hormone. Um, and this has been tested. They've been tested and it's been shown that many of them contain T4 or T3. And um, so that's a word of caution suggested by the ATA to let our patients know that this is a possibility um, that these thyroid support agents could be adulterated um, with T4 or T3. Also of importance um, are interfering, interfering medications and conditions that it can interfere with um, the absorption of thyroid hormone or the action of thyroid hormone. There's a whole long list that your doctor can help you with but just common things that we, we talk about, um, fiber, soy, espresso coffee. There's a report of Italians taking their thyroid hormone with espresso coffee, and that leads to malabsorption of the thyroid hormone. So um, my patients who are doing well and have stable thyroid hormone levels on replacement all of a sudden come and do a blood test and their TSH is elevated and their thyroid hormones are out of whack. I ask them if they either went to Italy or began to take on Italian habits. Uh, as one of the questions that, that I asked them. Medication supplements, very common, iron, calcium, in general vitamins, uh, medications to treat um, our osteoporosis like bisphosphonates, um, Orlistat, which was a medication used for the, the treatment of obesity, um, can bind up or interfere with the absorption of thyroid hormone. Um, the absorption of thyroid hormone occurs just past the stomach in the first part of the small intestine. And um, so these agents can interfere with the absorption. So sometimes patients go to their uh, primary doctor and they're prescribed calcium or some other medication. And the next time they come to see us, their thyroid hormone tests are out of whack and we have to kind of be a little bit of a detective and figure out why this um, is occurring. Also medical conditions, this is kind of more obvious to to kind of um, to get it's uh, because it's a big life-changing um, type of event like bypass surgery or the diagnosis of bowel disease. Um, however, um, H. pylori, which is a common um, 
bacterial infection that can occur in the stomach and can be associated with dyspepsia and ulcers and can be treated easy, pretty easily medically um, can lead to inflammation in the stomach and malabsorption of the, the thyroid hormone. And that's something that we also consider when there's a change from the stable state in our patients. So um, that's all I had. And